Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's episode of Analyze Nanfield, your tactics and analytics podcast, courtesy of the Blood Red Channel. I'm Josh Williams, and I'm joined by Mo Stewart. Mo, it's been a busy morning, mate. It has been a very, very busy morning. Uh, it's funny because normally you ask me how my week's been, and normally I'm very cheery. Say, so, oh, things have been good. My week's been awful. Like, it's genuinely <laughs> been awful. Like, I'm dealing with all kinds of, of difficulties around the house and physically and stuff. And then all of a sudden, like you say, this morning, there was not one, but two potential bombshells that have kind of changed lots of things in our world. And yeah, just trying to kind of get my head around it as quickly as possible so I can start talking about it and maybe make some sense. <laughs> yeah, same to be honest, mate. Um, so we are recording on, on about Thursday lunchtime at the minute. Um, I don't think this podcast is going out until Friday, so God knows what will have happened by then. Yeah. <laughs> But as as of right now, at least, uh, it looks like Jordan Henderson and Fabinho could realistically leave Liverpool uh, in the coming weeks. 40 million bid, apparently, from Saudi Arabia for Fabinho, and about a 10 million pound bid or so for Jordan Henderson, but one which will see his wages get quadrupled, which is obviously a massive thing. Um, So it's kind of come out of nowhere, really. I... I mean, you're gonna get. I'm gonna have to get to grips with my thought li- thoughts live on the show, to be honest, because I don't really yeah. feel like I've had much time to kind of gauge what's going on. To be honest, I mean, should we start with Henderson? I think that's a bit more established. Um, that's been going on for like the past 24 hours or so. What are your thoughts, Mo? It's it's a weird one, really, because I think the Saudi question in general is a complex and emotive issue, and. For, as far as I'm concerned, there's two strands to it. There's the one country, a new player coming into the football financial period and having the muscles to be able to take everyone's players away and be the dominant force. And then there's this whole sports washing element to it. There are two strands for me. I think for, on the first strand, it's I think it's fair enough in terms of uh, you can have a new country coming in. So this happens before. We've mentioned it on previous shows. It happened in Russia it happened in China previously, where all of a sudden there was a large influx of money and they were using it to try and get mostly stars coming to the end of their careers, but still stars. This seems to have moved beyond that at a pace. You saw, obviously, Ruben Neves, who's a player who was still in his mid-20s, still expecting to play international football, and he's gone there. And I think that's the crux of it for me with Jordan Henderson. Because... From a perspective, I can understand why he would be potentially interested to leave Liverpool because he will have seen the writing on the wall, as we've been saying for weeks, about how much of a role he's going to realistically play within the team and what role that will be. And we've seen many, many times in the past where he has sacrificed himself to the team. But I always wondered, he's always resisted the Milner role. He has always resisted it. As much as we talk about it being a natural progression for him, he's never really wanted that job. So I wouldn't, I was always a part of me who thought maybe he's going to continue to resist it. And maybe that's what this is. From Liverpool's perspective, it's a very different question because, yes, as we've agreed, Henderson will be playing a smaller role on the pitch. But with taking into account who else is leaving, his influence in terms of being able to help some of the other players who are going to be starters and to just generally keep the group together and ticking in the right direction has gone up massively with the with the exits of everyone else. So it's how, how do you sell him on that role? And I believe that Jürgen Klopp would have done what he normally does, which is say that I still need you, I still want you. But whether or not this has turned his head. I don't know. It appears to have. I, I've still not heard anything concrete from his own mouth. Now, obviously, David Onstein is a very highly respected journalist, and he's the one who said that he seems to be leaning towards it. But until I hear those words from his mouth, I'm always going to be sceptical. Yeah, it's it's definitely an insistent one. It could have changed dramatically by the time people listen to this podcast, really. Yeah. But as of right now, I think I pretty much agree with you, really. I think from the player's perspective, I can understand why um, 
I suppose the writing is on the wall a little bit when it comes to his Liverpool time. He is now 33, and I know across his Liverpool career, he's consistently kind of put up these battles against like the new sign and things like that. And he's he's continued to establish himself and find a way into the team. You know, Brendan Rodgers tried to swap him for Clint Dempsey, I think, at one point. Um, at one point, we get in the likes of Naby Keita and, and Alex Oxley chamberlain Henderson remains as a starter. Fabinho comes in to take Henderson's sixth role. Henderson says, can I start playing as an eight then? And he starts playing as an eight for the rest of his time at Liverpool. But I think this one now could be... I mean, he looks in immaculate physical shape, to be fair to him. Yeah. But I think this one could be a bit of a stretch too far in terms of I think he's up against Sobos life for the for the starting role in, in the role that he's played for the past 10 games, at least in this new system. And I don't think he's going to oust Sobos Lai in, in majority of big games, at least. He might be playing against, you know, domestic cup games, things like that. He might get in the team. Um, but overall, I don't I don't think he's any any longer a guaranteed starter. I think far from it, to be honest. And as you say, that, that Milner role, he maybe isn't particularly keen on that. Um, so I think it makes sense for the player to kind of consider a new start. From my perspective with it, and from like if I was like Jürgen Klopp or whatever, my, my biggest worry with that would be, I said last week, Henderson technically covers three positions for us, really. Yeah. He doesn't start in any of them. And he's a big earner. But he does cover three for you in terms of, like, if Fabinho does leave or Fabinho's out or whatever, you've got an option for a six day. If Sobos lies out, you've got an option for the right side of the eight. Has played on the left side of the eight as well at, at times, Henderson, over the years. And I think he's an option for the, the, the inverted fullback role as a more limited version of Trent yeah. when needs a rest. So... You're losing quite a lot there if you do let him go, which is one of the reasons I would have kept them. But I don't think this is one of them where Liverpool would stand in his way almost. So it, it creates a bit of a void for you to address in the market, like definitely, which I we will touch on. The, the, the fact of Liverpool having to have a difficult conversation with him in terms of diminishing his role and everything that we've heard about Jurgen Klopp since he's been here in terms of He's always been of the opinion that if someone wants to leave, he's not we're going to stand in their way. I think all of those things add up to the fact that Liverpool have kind of been a bit like, OK, but I'm with you. I think I agree the fact that he was, he's not going to be a starter in this team. But there's five subs in the Premier League and in Europe, and he is always going to be one of those guys you look to. If, think about game situations. Think about times when you need... Liverpool to be a little bit calmer, just play it simple for five minutes. Maybe they've got a one-goal lead, there's 25 minutes to go. These are the kind of situations I still think Jordan Henderson would be really useful in. And to be honest with you, if we these are the only situations we're really asking him to do, then I think he's going to be even better at them. Because it's going to have he's going to be fresher to be able to still run around like a madman for 25 minutes rather than for 65 minutes. Because that's the point. The problem with Henderson, I think, for me over the last two years, it's not so much that he's not the player he used to be. It's that he can't be that player for as long as he, we need him to be. So there's been plenty of games where I've thought after 35 minutes, oh, Henderson's having a good game here. And then we get to 50 and he literally just falls off a cliff. So I think he can still be a really useful and really needed member of the side. I just think that maybe after all this time, it's harder for him to accept that. Maybe it's just like, Look, I don't, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to sacrifice anymore. I don't want to have to do all those things anymore. I've done my service for this club over the course of the last decade, and I feel like I've done my best, and I feel like that we've been successful. Now I want to think about myself. Now, that in the context of a player leaving the club is all well and good. Obviously, cannot ignore the fact that there is the 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 question of where he's going particularly in the context of everything he said and stood for to this point that comes into it when you talk about that decision. But speaking of the money, I think the rumours are £700,000 a week or something like that. It needs to be yeah. £1.3 million pounds, uh, if he was doing it here with all of our tax. So as much as you can't really say that someone who's clearly already rich is getting life-changing money, it kind of is. It's just not life-changing in the way that it would be for you or I. It's not like from yeah. zero to 100, but from like, you know, 85 to 95, 
it's still a big step. Like, so you can see from the financial perspective why he's considering it. I, I just think it's a mistake for football reasons. I think that John Henson still wants to play in the Euros next summer. I still find it hard to believe that there's going to be enough players there of that age and still internationally active for it to not become just a retirement league. At the moment, it is still a retirement league, a very expensive, a very well gilded, but still a retirement league. And Henderson and Ruben Nevers alone aren't enough to change that. And maybe what got up in Celtic. So this is why I'm finding it hard to believe with all of these things. But for me, I still, I think that going there is ending his England career dead. And I just don't believe that that's what he wants to do right now. Yeah, it's it's an interesting one, it really is. You, you you mentioned there that he's um still a useful player. I think he I think he is definitely a useful player, and I think this coming season, as I say, he, he can cover three roles in this in this system. I think he would benefit from being moved away from the final third, which is he kind of occupied those spaces for the past couple of seasons a little bit. I think he's always a player who's better in deeper areas, better when. He's not expected to be so elaborate on the ball, and he can play in a bit more of a almost a bit more of a limited way when he's just doing a job and being a functional player for the team. I think that's when he's at his best. So, I think he could have been a helpful presence over the over the next, and he might still be if he, if this move doesn't doesn't happen. But it looks like a goer, really, doesn't it? So, um, it is a surprising one. Like, and I, and I think obviously you've got to throw in there. It, it's hard to bring up Jordan Henderson without talking about this concept of leadership, but I think with him. It obviously applies a lot. You know, he's a, he's been at Liverpool for longer than any of his teammates, I think I'm right in saying. Um, the only player at the club, I think, who has been a first-team player since Klopp was appointed. So he's been there for for his whole tenure. And um, obviously, we've just lost James Milner, vice-captain. Henderson's the captain. Uh, we, we're, we're well stacked when it comes to captains anyway, but it's still quite a big deal, really, isn't it? And, um, I don't know. I think I, I'm just kind of thinking, how, how will this impact Liverpool on the pitch and things like that? And, and I mean, so in so many ways. And I think sometimes people scoff when we talk about leadership and we talk about these intangible things as being important and we feel like we give them more credence than they deserve. But the fact of the matter is, we as fans only see a football team for about maybe five, ten percent of the time that they're together. Like all of the time that they're in training, traveling to and from games, all of that other time that they're with each other, socializing, building relationships, building chemistry, building the team. Like we don't see that. So we don't know how big an impact that has. But you see it every player who leaves, every single player who leaves Liverpool, they they give deference to, to Jordan Henson in particular. A lot of them mentioned Milner as well and how they made them feel, how they made them the best versions of themselves to be able to play on the football pitch. That stuff matters. And yes, obviously we mentioned the leaders, obviously Virgil van Dijk, Andrew Robertson, Mo Salah. There are a good core of people who have been there a long time. I would say even obviously Joe Gomez has been there. He's the only one who would be pre-clop if Hendo left. They've been there a long time, so they will be able to maintain those values. But the specific roles that Henderson and Milner play, and I think Henderson in particular went above and beyond quite a few times. I think it's a big step to lose both of them at the same time. And yes, we are talking about players who are coming towards the end of their usefulness at Liverpool, so we are going to need to use them eventually. But that means that we need to do it smart. We need to give us the best possible chance of it not being a big deal to get over them. And we're going to come on to talk about potential incomings, but it, if it does turn out to be we're asking two teenagers and a right back to be our defensive midfield next season, I'm going to be a little bit like, that, is that enough? Is that is that wise? Yeah, I mean, another one of the things that you've got to throw in there is Henderson is yet another homegrown player. Yeah. Um, obviously, we've just lost Ox, we've just lost Milner, now we're losing Henderson. Uh, now Phillips could depart, Kelleher could leave, potentially. Um, so that's kind of like a bit of a going concern, really. And 
I think that almost above everything else is why I kind of believe the Lavia links are probably genuine, to be honest, because he's a player who Liverpool could get in to fill some of this need. Um, and I think I'm right in saying, A, they, they wouldn't need to register him in any way because he's he's young enough to, to be justified in that sense. But when they do have to register him eventually, he would qualify as a homegrown player. So I think that would be a way of Liverpool getting around this void a little bit. And that, that's why I think Liverpool, that's one of the main reasons I think Liverpool are potentially interested in him. Um, but yeah, in, in terms of Henderson, like it's, it's obviously a huge thing. And um, on top of that news this morning, uh, Fabinho news has come out. Um, same 24 hour period, apparently a 40 million pound bid from, from Al Itihad, I think is how you say it. Um, remains to be seen at this stage whether he's even insisted, we don't even know anything about that, really. But if that move was to happen, I mean, where, where'd you stand on that one? That one was uh, <laughs> crazy, wasn't it? I mean, I mean I yeah, it was, it was almost like we, we're still kind of reeling from one and then hit with another. But yeah, yeah. it is fascinating to me. The interesting wrinkle for the Fabinho story is that it was mentioned that it's going to go quickly one way or another. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that they've already agreed personal terms? So it's just a case of Liverpool saying, yes, we'll sell him, and then that's it? And if so, when did that happen? Why has that happened? How has that happened? But there's, there's, there's lots of unanswered questions. The difference between Fabinho and Henderson, for me, there's two key differences. One, in terms of how people feel about him going there in comparison to Henson, as I mentioned, because of the things that Henson said, it's slightly different. Also, £40 million pounds for Fabinho at this stage in his career feels a lot more like a normal deal than £10 million pounds for Henson, by the way. That's all they're offering, £10 million. Pounds. I would absolutely not take that. £40 million for Fabinho, though, I mean, we were doing the Q&A, what was it, last week? And they were talking about how much would you take? And it was like 50 million for Van Dijk, wasn't it 85 for Salah? Like, 40 million for Fabinho. And I'm like... Yeah, I, th I think ah. the, the thing with that is, I think uh, 10 million does feel like very little for Henderson, especially considering he's got two years left on his contract. But he is a big earner, and this would be one of the ways in which to get a big earner off the bill without kind of selling on to a fellow Premier League rival. Um the only kind of way to get those big earners off your wage bill who are kind of getting on a little bit is is either basically cut the contract, like mid mid contract, like Arsenal have done a few times with like Mesut Ozil and, and players like that, or sell them to to Saudi or somewhere quite quite far away essentially. Mm -hmm. Um, so that'd be one positive in that sense, really. But with, with Fabinho, I think another major difference is just the fact that he's a starter this coming season. He's, he's probably going to get a lot of game time. And, if you was to put Liverpool's fixed eleven on 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 a pitch now, the best players make, making up the system. Fabinho would be in it um, for now at least. But he's twenty nine. Um, he's got a lot of minutes in his legs. I think I've touched on this in the past. It's it's it was a lot anyway when I checked. I think I think in terms of league minutes alone, I think it was about thirty three thousand across his career. Let me just double check. Oh, oh no, a little bit less than that. About, about 29,000 or so, but I'm pretty sure that someone like Casemiro, for example, has got about 22,000 in his legs. Yeah. I think Joe Polinia's got about... I mean, what, what was Polinia? Can you remember what Polinia was? Wasn't very it much, was it? really it was tiny. It was, it was, it, I think it was less than two. Uh, it I, I don't remember 15, the number. 15, 15. Oh, so yeah. we've got ha half, half Fabinho in his legs, essentially. Um, and if you're getting a £40 million pound offer for them. I must be honest, if I'm looking at it purely from an objective perspective, removing it and emotion and all that stuff, I would probably... I would seriously think about selling both, I think. My worry, though, wouldn't necessarily be that. It would be how we replace them. That, that would be the big thing for me. It, it, it entirely depends upon that. I think if you if you're getting rid of those two and you're getting in Lavia, I'd be concerned. Um, we need more than that. We need more proven quality, I think, than that. Um, but the actual sales in isolation, part of me does think 
you could really say it's time for it. Really, um, you know, I, I don't know. What, what do you think? With Fabinho, that's the thing. For me, you can make arguments for both of them to say that yes, it is the right time. It is the right opportunity. If they put up more than ten million pounds, maybe well double that. Then maybe we'll talk. But it's one or the other for me. We can't do both. Like I just, I know that eventually we're going to have to do both. I just don't. I just. It's one of those things where some everything in football, there's a mitigated amount of risk. There are no guarantees in football. You can buy someone, think they're going to be good, et cetera, et cetera. So whenever you think, oh, that's probably going to happen, it still might not happen. But as I say, going in with an entirely new group in that midfield, and we've seen how long it takes players to get used to playing in the Jurgen Klopp midfield, even if it's a slightly different Jurgen Klopp midfield than it was before, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a simpler job. It looks like it's actually going to be more difficult based on what we've seen so far and how the, the different tasks we've asked them to play. So there's no guarantee it's going to gel straight away. I just think we're leaving ourselves potentially open by selling them both, which is why I think that Fabinho is the better deal. But I'm like you. I need to see who we, who's coming in. I need... It's like... Fabinho is a good selling Fabinho at forty million pounds at this stage in his career is a good deal, provided he's is replaced by the right player. The wrong player, then no, it's not worth it. Not just because, yes, he's definitely on the downward scale, but it's not necessarily going to continue to be as dramatic as it has been. I still think that he, if you if you said to me we're going to have Fabinho for the rest of the next season, I still think that we'd still get some good play out of him, and I'd still expect him to be good or more days than he's not good. But we all know that those days are numbered, as we've mentioned. So if, we, if we're going to go for someone outside of our normal age range, so if we are going to look to replace someone with a little bit maybe more experience of, 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 of higher football, a little bit more presence, maybe say, just throwing names out around in the dark, Leon Goretzka, for example, someone of that ilk, I'll be like, okay, let's talk. But <laughs> if it is just going to be all young projects or younger players who are going to grow into superstars, which is what we normally do, I'm concerned. See, the, the thing with Fabinho, I, I actually, I don't think he's as bad as the past year has made him look because I think a lot of it stems from A, a lack of legs in the midfield surrounding him and B, um, I think the system was just essentially not not painted in a way that made him thrive almost. I think once we got three players around him with the box, he looked a lot better. But having said that, I, I do, as I said, I do think he, I do think his prime is behind him now. I do think he's a, he's not over the hill, but it, we've seen the best version of Fabinho yeah, for me. Agree. Um, and I think cons- considering that we paid about, I think we paid about thirty five million or so for him. And we're getting forty million for him now. It it is a good deal. I do think you've probably got to take it. If I'm honest, but the big thing is just again it goes back to it. How how do you replace him? I mean, it, if there's one thing that's for certain, it's if both of them leave, Liverpool need a six. That that's yeah. absolutely guaranteed. So far this summer, I haven't overly been too. I haven't stressed on that too much because I've been like. The, the nature of this system, Liverpool need eight, and in terms of the six, you've got Besetic, you've got Thiago, you've got Henderson, you've got Fabinho. That's enough cover for me for players like that. Um, but if you're losing Henderson and Fabinho, you definitely need a six, um, which is interesting because considering the the landscape at the minute, like if you look at the market, I did this a few weeks ago for Redmond TV. Just kind of looked at the the landscape of sixes and. But what I kind of found was that there's like maybe one, two, three kind of really high quality options, but then everything below that is just a bit middle of the road almost. Like there's, mm. there's not, it's not a great market from what I looked at. Um, but Liverpool are forcing themselves into that market if they allow both of these players to go, obviously. Yeah. And I mean, it, I dare say there's a few players who have moved earlier on in the window, namely Mr. Regate. Who maybe would look a little bit more promising now if we were, we were trying to replace two midfielders from our six 
stocks, you're going to have him and then a, a, someone of a different profile. But yeah, it's, it's, it's fascinating. That's why I kind of mentioned someone like a Goretzka because most of the players who have been kind of linked in that era, they are still, like you say, they're, they're good at some things, but they're not quite the complete player. The ones who are closer to what you call that complete player are the ones who are going for 100 million quid. Well, I think I think he's gone. Has he gone? Can we check that? Has Declan Rice actually moved to Arsenal? Because if I, he has, I don't think he has. I don't think he nah, has. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's worth a call. Um, but no, him and obviously Caicedo being the other one, um, who does appear like is far along the road with Chelsea. Um, those are the ones who I would say are, are more perfectly suited in terms of age and ability, and they're clearly beyond our price range if things are to be believed over the course of this summer. So it is a difficult shop. It is a very difficult thing to do and with not a lot of time to do it because obviously pre-season is literally upon us. So the idea of having to make those kind of more fundamental changes this late on kind of undoes a lot of the good work we've done and getting our attacking midfield in early. Because, yeah, I don't know, you might be stacking everything in the front and then look behind you and all of a sudden it all tips into the seat. And we don't really need that. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it is interesting. I mean, you've just mentioned there, but you just listed a few targets there. We, we might as well do that now. I think a lot of people probably would be interested to know like who is out there as an option that we could potentially explore. Obviously, Rice hasn't technically signed for Arsenal yet, but I don't think that one's a goer. Um, Imagine if we did, though. That would be hilarious. <laughs> that would be hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> I think if I was Michael Arteta, I'd just retire, I think, on the spot. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, I, th- I think Casado as well. I'm a huge fan of Casado. I think Casado was very, very good. But, again, first of all, I would wonder what wages he's agreed with Chelsea because I think Chelsea tend to be a little bit daft sometimes when it comes to that. Thank and you. on top of that, Brighton know that they've just sold us Alexis McAllister for £35 million. That is a steal. It looks like they want to get paid when it comes to his casino. So you're talking a lot of money there. And if Liverpool did sell for being Johan Henderson, you raise about 50, 60 million. Maybe you could throw that at, at Brighton for Casado and, and add a bit on the top of it. But um, knowing what Liverpool are like, we've already spent a fair amount so far. I, think, I don't think Liverpool want to go too crazy in terms of, you know, I think some of this Henderson for being your money will be used to kind of recoup some of the money we've paid so far, I think, sadly. Mm-hmm. Um, but they are two kind of elite options for me, obviously, Rice and, and Casado. Um, on top of that, I don't know if you've got any names, mate. I mean, it, it when you think about it, because of the nature of the two players we're losing, obviously, I, I, I would like to see a player come in who's a tiny bit more established than, than Romeo Lavia, who's 19 still. Yeah. So if, if you're thinking players, you know, in, in the range of like maybe 22 to 26 or so, I mean, does anyone come to mind? I mean, you know, you know who comes to mind. You know who I'm going to say. Everybody, drum roll, Yusuf Avada. <laughs> Yusuf Avada is still at Monaco. And, and to be fair, I would actually even say Mohamed Kamara, his partner in central midfield, might also be worth a look because, in terms of age range, in terms of price range, in terms of okay, there's probably still some gaps in terms of his ability, in terms of his ability, you know, his passing range, etc. But I think that there's enough tools in there, enough upside for him to come in and be the guy that we need in that sixth position. I mean, I'm always going to say that. I do think, though, I, I like the idea of us getting someone in who is already a little bit further up the food chain. So, again, I mentioned Goretzka. I was only half joking. In fact, I'm not joking at all. I think that... He's do you think Goretzka's a sixth, though? I think... If you're playing, if you're playing with someone, if, if you're playing someone more close to a diamond, then we're only gonna. I wouldn't play him as a six, no. But if you're playing it more of the box where there's kind of two alongside each other, then I'd maybe consider it. But I think if we were replacing Fabinho and Henderson, obviously, I think we're gonna need more options in other places because as you mentioned, Henderson covered more than just that six position. So. I'd be looking maybe to say, okay, he can do this sometimes, he can do that sometimes. But outside of that, 
it's difficult. There's no one, no one immediately springs to mind. I think, and that's that's the thing that we're here, isn't it? It's almost like they'll have their lists, and a lot of the people who've been on my list previously have moved. So, yeah, the, I'm I'm thinking about the Fabinho void in particular. To be honest, I think Henderson is obviously a player who, who can cover different positions and stuff like that. Whereas Fabinho has been the team's fixed holding presence now since 2018 and. When I say a holding presence, I mean the lad who stands in the middle third, usually around the centre circle, and just holds the four for you and extinguishes fires and, and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, Liverpool well, really don't have another one of those, apart from possibly a percentage potentially in the future and stuff. But I think we would need an established player who's done that for a few seasons. So, so, someone like, I, I think Joe Pellini is a good example, I think he's 28. I was going to say a little bit, a little bit past it, and and West Ham were reportedly looking at him as a replacement for Rice and Fulham with chatting a hundred million. So I don't think that one's a goer. Um, I, 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 but the thing with that, I wonder whether Fulham are basically saying we want seventy five percent of the Rice money. They weren't saying we think he's worth sixty million. We were saying we know you've got a lot of money, so you're going to have to give it to us. So they might not necessarily say he's sixty million to everybody, but. I agree. I don't think, like, as a player, as a profile, yes, I was going to say him, but I was also going to say that the price would, I think, for me, be the issue. It's definitely not value for money in that respect. I think a, a player who, who is of slight interest to me is, is Sofian Amrabat, I think. He, he is a realistic one, I think. Um, still only 26, although he's at the back end of 26, he's, he's 27 fairly soon. Um, but he's, he's Quite physical. He does have experience playing as a lone six. Mm-hmm. Um, only plays for Fiorentina, I think. So he's he's certainly attainable. Looked really, really good in the World Cup. Obviously, um, good at putting a foot in and, and very aggressive and industrious and stuff. But can also play his, his progressive passes numbers, passing numbers mm-hmm. for Fiorentina and Serie A. Are really good. He moves the ball through the lines well. Keeps the ball well. Um, so I think in terms of like a ready-made can come in and just do exactly what Fabinho has done. And Rabat is, is someone who I would be interested in because he, he's been there's been talk of a transfer for him for quite a while and he's, he still hasn't moved. He doesn't really no. seem to be any concrete links. No, Manchester and, United have been sniffing around previously, but I don't know where they're at now with it. Yeah, well, I'm not even sure why United are interested, to be honest, unless he's going to be kind of a, long, a long-term replacement for Casemiro. Um, if you look at his contract... His contract is due to expire next year as well. So he'd be a player for me who f- fits the bill enough for Liverpool to have a conversation, I think. Um, but there isn't many of those. I mean, some others come to mind, like potentially potentially Florentino Luis at Benfica, maybe. Yeah. Um, but again, I'm not sure what the price would be there. I think he'd probably cost a bit more. Well, I think Benfica at the moment, they ha- they're... Potentially um, warding off interest for Gonzalo Ramos. So if they do a big deal for him, the way that they normally work is that they only really need to do one big deal per summer. So it might be one of those whereby if they sell him for big money, they would keep Luis. But if they will kind of come in before that deal gets done, there might be something there. Who knows? Yeah, he's 20. Yeah, this is only unrealistic. He's 23 and he's got a contract until 2027. So... Yeah, I can't see it. That'd be that, expensive. <laughs> <laughs> that would be very expensive. Well, um, I mean, another name that we threw out before previously was um, uh, Lobotka at Napoli. Uh, and again, the difference being he is a little bit older. But as I was saying previously, I think if you are losing those two and you are looking at the profile of the guys behind them and you've got Bicecic at 19, potentially uh, maybe a Lavia or someone else about help coming in also young. I do think you need to have another older presence alongside them. And Lobotka is one of those who's been steadily improving over the course of the last four seasons. Obviously, he's an Serie A champion with Napoli this season. And I think in terms of his game style, he was very much got the ability to do six and do eight bits as well. So I wouldn't be surprised if he was another guy under consideration, but... Again, it'll be difficult. Yes, Napoli are in a situation where it's clear that things aren't going to be the same 
Um, obviously, the manager's gone. Kim Min Jae looks like he's gone to Bayern Munich. But as it stands, Caravascalia and Osterman are still there. So they're still going to be a dangerous football team. So I think that they'll still be in a strong enough position to ask for a decent fee for Lobotka. But again, like I'm sort of thinking of time. When, when are we going to be doing all these things? And that's why ultimately I find it very hard to believe that Liverpool will sanction both deals this summer. I think it's, I think, I think it, I, a week ago I'd have said none, but now I do think that one of them is going to go. Um, my gut feeling is still Fabinho, but um, yeah, I'd be shocked and more than slightly concerned if Liverpool did both of these deals. But the thing about it from the other perspective, because like, with Saudi and the way that they're looking to build that league, it's about more than having a good football team. It's about prestige. And Jordan Henderson is the captain of Liverpool. Jordan Henderson is the captain of Liverpool who has got pictured lifting all the trophies. He is arguably outside of Salah, Van Dijk and maybe Trent, the most prestigious man in terms of being able to sell him on the global scale. I So... I think some of those things would have come into it as well. But yeah, I'm like you. Like, if I'm Steven Gerrard coming into a place and I'm looking for a marquee signing to kind of like really hit the ground running, I'm probably not going for Fabinho or John Anderson. But I mean, he's Gerrard in his managerial career has been very keen to get familiar, strong voices around him. Going back to Gary McAllister, Michael Beale. Um, so maybe this is it as well. Maybe he wants basically someone to be him in the dressing room when he's not around. And Jordan feels like a good uh, fit for that particular role. I mean, you, you might be right. You might, I'm not ruling out them both being done. I I can see a world where it happens. I just think that it will be a mistake. Yeah. I think obviously there's, there's been talk as well over here. Adeline Chiuameni who I, I personally can't see it happen. I don't think people are talking like men would just want to get rid of him, but I'm not sure they even do. Is, is that actually a thing? Well, here's the thing with Real Madrid, right? They've got a kind of... I have no idea what kind of formation they're expecting to play because if Real Madrid are still actively trying to bring in Kylian Mbappe this summer, are they going to force him to play centre forward in the way that he clearly doesn't want to play and doesn't do for PSG? Yeah, I, because, I've wondered this. I've wondered this. Like, let's be real here. The guy who plays left wing for Real Madrid is the best left winger in the world. <laughs> like, so it's not like you can just go, oh, he's some bum there. I'll just go and play for him. So, how are they going to do it? How are they yeah. going to configure it? Are they going to move Vinicius over? And if so, then how, what effect does that have for the midfielders, for Valverde, for Camavinga, for Chalameni? Like, because you look at the... I looked at the Real Madrid website the other day for some reason that I was trying to torture myself. And you look at them, they've got eight, eight mid-listed midfielders and, like, six of them legitimately currently would be in the top 20 midfielders in the world. And then one of them, Arda Guler, probably will be in three years. And then the other one's Danny Ceballos. And it's so... It's just literally an embarrassment of riches. Yeah. And you have to think that you can maybe say to one of them, look, there's not going to be room for all y'all here. Come with us and be the guy. But personally, I can't see it happening. I think if it was going to, if I'd be looking I mean, at either too many or Valverde for that, but I don't think either of them want to leave. And to be frank, I can see why they don't want to leave. I mean, two of many is one I, for the record, that's one I would definitely do if it was if it was there. I think he could be a six for Liverpool. I'm thinking strictly sixes personally in terms of like that that player who holds the fours, and mm. two of many could definitely do it. Um, another one, another name I'd throw out there is is, but again, you're getting slightly slightly further down the list now. But Edson Alvarez is is at Ajax at the minute. Uh, mm. 25 years old. He's been around longer than you'd think. But he's a player who who seems to be good and, and uh, plays a lot of minutes, just being linked with Borussia Dortmund. But I think uh, a move collapsed. Um, who else was I looking at then? <laughs> I was looking at someone else. Oh, oh, yeah, I think this also kind of brings the Cone conversation back on the table a little bit. Um, 
I was previously not particularly high on that one, simply because I didn't overly see the need for that kind of mm. player with the players that we had. If we're now losing Henderson and Fabinho, I think maybe there's now a bit more of a need for the Kone or a player like that at least. Um, no, I agree. And I mean, do we know how bad his injury is or isn't? No, I, I was going to say that then. I'm not sure, you know, if it's one of them that have ruled him out of a transfer this summer or anything like that. I've got no clue, to be honest. Um, but I think in terms of the bill, six weeks, apparently, according to our producer. So I think it's possible, but probably renders it a bit less likely, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, again, thinking about the fact that if we would be losing those two, we're already going to be having Elliot and Jones come back late because they've got to the Euro 21 final. So in terms of who would be starting midfield early on, I mean, obviously, Bicetic looks like he's back to fitness, but he is still officially being recovery. So it, was, it's, it, it makes it a very, very, very tough question. And when you consider, again, we're going into the season, starting the season with a very tough game, potentially, away at Chelsea. I do think it's one of those situations where we want our first game, first 11 of the season to be a, yes, this, let's go with this team kind of 11. And yeah, yeah. That, that's another reason why I think selling them both doesn't make sense. But hey, we'll see. Well, we'll, we'll round up now then. Um, we'll round up with like a concluding thought. So what is your kind of overriding thought? If you was... Klopp, what what would you be doing here type thing? Firstly, <laughs> firstly, difficult, isn't it? Firstly, I'd be texting Stephen Gerrard saying, what the fuck are you up to? I thought we were playing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, think, I think the key to everything is who comes in. I mean, we've, we've not mentioned Ryan Gravenberg. I think we need to mention Ryan Gravenberg because I do think that in Klopp's mind when he was looking at him, he was thinking of him as a maybe not always, but sometimes six option. If if in the world where he one of the guys they really want suddenly becomes available, or they, they think the money they get from this will make him available, then I can see a world where it makes sense. Again, as you mentioned at the top of the show, in isolation, the 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 factors into all of the deal, they do individually make sense. I think Fabinho in particular, like I said, I don't I don't think at any point from now in the future till the end of his contract, someone's going to offer us 40 million quid for Fabinho again. Mm. So that makes me think maybe take that money. But the replacement is key because I do think that he was, as it stands, scheduled in for a larger role this season than any of the others we've spoken about. Yeah, I would agree pretty much. I think if it was me, I would want to be able to sell both, I think, if we could. But that's the big question for me. I don't want to do it at the risk of Liverpool finishing fifth again. Liverpool yeah. needs to be better next season. And I don't want to sell both if it means Liverpool are suddenly going to fall off an even bigger cliff or not be able to climb as was intended this season. So, would sell, would lean towards selling Fabinho more than Henderson. Me too. But a lot of it depends on who we get in. As the uh, as the replacements, but it's definitely one to watch. I'd like to say that we'll be back next week to talk about this because by next week it would have evolved quite a bit, I think. Mm. But I'm going to be away, so I won't be here to talk about it. Mo, you can appear on your own. No, feel free, mate. Depending on what. Oh well, on. well, I mean, it depends on what's happened. <laughs> <laughs> like, like genuinely, if 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 we sold them both, then I might be uh, asking you to do a Zoom from from wherever <laughs> you're going to be on holiday or whatever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I hope I don't miss it all, you know. I hope I hope I'm not away for the buzz. But um, yeah, I mean, the week after that, we will we will be back and uh, we're ed- edging towards the start of the Premier League season and all that by that point. But yeah, definitely want to keep an eye on. Lots of interesting stuff going on. Mo, thanks for joining us, mate. No worries, man. I'm going back to Twitter to see if anything's changed. Same. I'm doing the same. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks for tuning in. Get back to Twitter, and we'll see you in two weeks. <laughs>